correct information to attend this talk. I've only been the honorary consul for 20 years, not 40 years. And if I'm good enough, maybe I'll get to 40, but I don't think that will be possible. So mm -hmm. thank you all the same for that lovely extra 20 years of honorary consulship. Second, I'd like to bring to the attention of all watching the relationship between the Chabad Rabbi Yaakov Raskin and some of the old Jamaican Jewish communities. It's excellent. Some are not comfortable, but Jews are Jews, regardless of how we practice our belief. Interestingly, this year is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the United Congregation of Israelites. That is the event that joined both the English and German congregation and the Sephardic or Spanish and Portuguese congregations together. And we have worshiped together over these past hundred years in Shari Shalom Synagogue, which many of you who are watching this program tonight know intimately. May I congratulate the two rabbis in hosting this program and reaching out to this, to this all of us in this auspicious year of the Jamaican Jewish community. So let us begin. The new world began with the encounter, not the discovery when Columbus and others followed and came to the Americas, they found people living in these countries. He, Columbus, founded only the Caribbean, not India. The Caribbean is the part of the Americas that he never landed, but he never landed in North America. So we could argue for hours as to why Columbus sailed on Tishabab, but it's not the history that I wish to share. We've already had an understanding of what Tishabab was all about. It was just another day, a day in which Tokimada took control of the Spanish crown, and we have had a major series of information of experiences, not the best in the world since then. You can read, in fact, the expul expulsion order on Google today. That is quite a horrendous document. He, Columbus, left behind at the start of the horrors of the expulsion and the Inquisition. The Inquisition became the decision to expel all Jews who wish to continue to worship as Jews to leave Spain. And the test of faith, the auto de fe of many of the conversers who remained. The test was named the auto de fe to determine whether or not they proved to be true Catholic believers or Judaizers. Those latter Judaizers were those Jews who outwardly converted to Catholicism, but were accused of maintaining Judaism in secret. These tests by the, the inquisitors were awful experiences, the loss of property, the poor torture, and for many, death by burning at the, tied to the stakes or by garroting. And I won't describe garroting to you now, but if you wish, you can look it up. Those who survived have become known today as the ancestors of the children of the Inquisition. That is now also a fascinating movie by that name. Watch it. It's not yet in public domain, but it has been shown as recently as this week on private connections to the various, to the various people who have log, log, logged into it. Some of the Columbus crew were conversos. And as history tells us, there was an early part in the, in the following centuries of conversos seeking to find places to live and to return to the beliefs of their ancestors. This, in essence, is the beginning of the story of Jamaica's Jews. Jamaica was first visited by Columbus in 1494 during the second voyage. He returned at the end of the fourth voyage in 1503. His two remaining vessels were no longer seaworthy and were beached on our north shore. And yes, we have tried to find them so far unsuccessfully. He persuaded the Taino people from the nearby village of Maima to care for him and his crew, even frightening them with the announcement of turning off the sun for not caring adequately, caring for him adequately. He reportedly knew of an eclipse and that was due and when it did happen, he exercised control over the Taino. That beach in which he declared that the sun could be turned off is in fact the beach at Seville. 
fortunately, it's still not a hotel bill, a hotel beach. He reportedly lived in Jamaica for what is now known as the Seville property for just over a year until he was rescued by a vessel sent from what is now the Dominican Republic. Our first long stay tourist, perhaps, as I mentioned earlier. His son Diego founded the first European settlement there and they named it Sevilla Nuevo, in English, New Seville, and today just Seville. In Jamaican, this was our first capital and is perhaps the most important post Colombian site in the New World, something that we have not fully recognized of its value and the stories it can tell us. As a result of these voyages, he was, he was titled Duke of, Duke of Jamaica and Admiral of the Seas. The island ended up being in the possession of the Colon family until it was captured by the English 145 years later. Did Jews settle here is a vexed question, answered simply, yes and no. Jamaica never had an inquisition to test conversos. Perhaps one reason was the Colon family. Another could have been the economy. No gold nor silver was found in the island. Spanish Jamaica was a small settlement growing animals for the conquistadors. There were something like 12 hatos or ranches without fences, of course, to grow these animals. There were no plantations under the Spanish. And so with no major economic activity, there was similarly no major religious activity encouraging any tests such as an auto de fe. So if there were conversos, they were not exposed and therefore not reported to exist. If they practiced Judaism, they did not make it public. So we do not know, but we believe that some did. There were reports that there were two sets of Spaniards, Christian and converso, who met the English when they captured the island 145 years later. Escovel was the first governor and Garay his deputy. Garay invested in growing sugar and the sugar mill at Seville was constructed for Garay in circa 1517. And it still exists, possibly and almost certainly the oldest in the Americas. It was reported that the production of sugar was under the guidance of some conversos who were brought here. They were brought for that purpose. Why and from where could have been from Madeira. They knew how to grow and process sugarcane in that island. These conversos brought here were known as Portugals, possibly given that name to allow them to come to the Spanish lands because the union between Spain and Portugal had not yet begun. So, were these the first Jews in Jamaica? Yes and no. The people of Jewish origin with Jewish names from Portugal, but not known to have practiced Judaism. The Spanish empire grew and grew the wealth generated from the gold and silver from the Americas. England was concerned, and so Cromwell, having abolished the monarchy, undertook to send an attack to the Spanish main, or rather to attack the Spanish main. That is the sea routes of the wealth of, from the mines to their country. He tried to attack the Dominican Republic first and was rebuffed. His Penn and Venables led expedition came to Jamaica after and succeeded. Jamaica was a prime site for the English with its safe and large Kingston Harbor. The Penn and Venables expedition attacked, attacked in May 1655 and literally walked to the capital, San Diego de la Vega, now known as Spanish Town. It was reported that about half the population fled. These were the old Spanish or Catholic Spanish families and half the others met the English, who were possibly descendants of conversos and the African servants of the Spanish. All told, the population at that time did not exceed 3,000 people. It was not a hard island to capture, especially when I think the English brought something like 14,000 people on their ships. After skirmishes lasting for nearly four years, and that ended with what is known as the Battle of Rio Nuevo in or Cabeza. The English took control and started to invite settlers, almost regardless of their religious beliefs, to settle. Part of the reason, of course, was that there was a very short number of people in the population 
and so they needed to have more people to be able to help to protect themselves and the island from all others. <clears throat> One of the interesting facts was that they endangered large numbers of Irish, and we can tell the truth of that today by our accent. Jamaica became another opportunity for Jews to settle in an English-run Caribbean country. Barbados was the first. The Dutch island of Curaçao had accepted Jews five years earlier than Jamaica. It is time now for us to recognize that Cromwell had met and developed a friendship with the Dutch rabbi Menasha ben Israel. He was a major influence on both how the then Dutch and on Cromwell to open the doors to allow conversos to become active Jews in English controlled lands. England itself allowed Jews to return after centuries of exile. So where did they come from? From Spain and Portugal, yes. Before the union with Spain, Portugal was a sort of refugees for conversos. We estimate that some 30,000 Jews fled from the expulsion in 1492 to Portugal. <clears throat> and so the refugee, the refuge that, that Portugal offered was that they did not exhibit Jewish, Jewishness and Jewish practices. The conversos who survived the Inquisition until the end of the 16th century were then exposed to the opportunity by the Reformation in Holland and in particular in Amsterdam. However, I must point out that whilst up to 1497, five years after the expulsion, the Jews who fled to Portugal were free to move about and practice much of their Jewish life. In 1497, Manuel, the King of Portugal, decided he wished to marry Ferdinand and Isabella's daughter. And the argument that was provided to him was, yes, get rid of all the Jews. And so the clever fellow decided that he would then baptize all the Jews in Portugal, taking them into the streets and byways and parks and baptizing them as Catholics. He was able to marry the Queen of uh, Isabella and Ferdinand's daughter. Those were conversos. They became conversos. Liking it or not, they became conversos. And I will admit to you right now, like it or not, many of us are descended from those families. So, what we have then, it must be pointed out that as part of the Sephardim, we are the Spanish and Portuguese Jews, really different from the Jews who left Spain and Portugal and fled to the Mediterranean and maintained their Jewishness. We became conversos and stayed as Catholic until we had the opportunity and the freedom to convert to become Jews again, and mainly in Amsterdam, which was the home of the Reformation, and we were allowed to practice Judaism once we got there. Not everybody did, however, that's another story. And the same thing happened also of those who fled eventually into the Americas and in New York. And one of the more famous families was the family of uh, the former merchant prince of Newport, Rhode Island, who's, who came over with his cousin, and he converted to Judaism and his cousin stayed as a good Catholic. So things are not quite as simple as it is in black and white or in Catholicism or Judaism. Okay. What we have to also recognize is that even if we had wanted to come to the Spanish countries in the Caribbean or in Latin America, we, could, we had to prove our purity of blood. In other words, there is a document that can be seen of my people who wish to, to visit or live in the New World, and they had to prove that they had four, year, four generations of pure Catholic blood. So conversos and descendants of conversos under four generations could not make it into the New World. Now, let's take that as gospel, but at the same time, being Jews, there were many different ways that conversos ended up in the New World to the extent that the Inquisition was introduced into Peru and into Mexico, and as recently as the, 16, uh, the 18, 1800s, Mexico still had Inquisition tests of faith being exercised on former conversos. 
So it's not an easy exercise to say it was just this or that. It was, in fact, it's co colored with many, many different issues. So where do we find that after, after the Union, or before all of the Union of Portugal and Spain, the Braganza Colon family shut their eyes, and we do think that a number of conversos were allowed in to Jamaica. Um, after that, it became much more difficult. So that is part of the story. So we go move far, fairly quickly to the countries in which the first Jews were allowed to settle in the Caribbean. And this is part of how we want to understand the picture because our, our role came in a little bit later. Barbados under the English was the first English colony to be able to have and allow Jews to settle there. But as we all know, Judaism died out in Barbados in the 1920s or 30s and was only returned to Barbados with the advent of people escaping from the Holocaust or escaping from what became the Holocaust in Europe. And of course, they have restored their magnificent synagogue and have built a beautiful museum and it's worth a visit anytime. Even found the mikvah that they were able to have conversions in. One thing that we have not been able to find, and I'll reach to that, is we have not been able to find any such building for our own activity with conversos, with, with conversions. However, Barbados was the first. Suriname was also there. And of course, Suriname was traded with the Dutch for an island called Manhattan. Um, the other area of interest was Brazil, which was captured by part, part of Brazil, which was captured by the, Port, the Portuguese Dutch in 1624. And the Portuguese recaptured it in 1654. And this becomes an interesting recapture because it starts a whole nother story of Jewish settlement in the Caribbean and in the Americas. 23 of Jews were uh, blown off course from this leaving Brazil, from relieving Recife to a go back to Holland. They got blown off the course and were landed in Jamaica. Jamaica was still Spanish in 1654 and they were allowed to land and there is a report that they were actually in jail, jailed in, in Jamaica to make sure that they didn't contaminate any of the local population. They were allowed to leave and ended up on the island of Manhattan when it was still Dutch, New Amsterdam. And they became the first Jews to settle in North America. We unfortunately can't have the claim of who we know settled in Jamaica first after the capture by England in 1655. We can only guess that we have documents that tell us when we started to answer the protests by the English merchants in Port Royal that we were taking away their business. And we have an, an evidence of those who signed those documents. But who came first is still a mystery to us, as the records of Port Royal disappeared with the earthquake of 1492. So, <clears throat> let us remember that the island, as we mentioned earlier, was sparsely populated, less than 3,000 persons. No gold, no silver, just cattle, horses, and hogs primarily to support the conquistadors and those who, that had settled where the riches were, where the mines were, where the wealth was being created. The English were committed to preserve the access to Kingston Harbor, which they continued for approximately 250 years. To do so, they settled the dry sandy spit at the end of what we today call Pal the Palisades. And most of you know where and what Port Royal is today, a nice little fishing village. The town that the English built in the 17th century style became known because of the return of the royalty after Cromwell was removed, was known, became known as Port Royal. This is the, where the capital was being, the capital money was being spent on public works, building four forts in particular to protect the entrance to the harbor. Port Royal became possibly the most important entrepot in the Americas hosting free trade but it had other so-called attributes. One such attribute was the fact that they were buccaneers. They had been called over to be, to be able to attack the Spanish shipping 
as licensed uh, as, as our licensed army, so to speak. And after the Treaty of Madrid in 1670, these buccaneers eventually decided that they had to continue their looting and they became known as pirates. And that's a whole other story, which um, there is an argument and a book that claims that we, that we, with the Jews, the Jewish pirates of the Caribbean is, a, is, is part of our, and of our ancestry and our heritage. I don't think there were very many of those, but certainly the Jews who settled Port Royal, early livelihood was that of possibly brokers to the buccaneers. And certainly they were successful enough to have purchased land within 20 years in Port Royal and built a synagogue. We have seen the record of the land purchase and have a written report of that building collapsing during the earthquake of June 1692. Most, we are, most of the Jews that ended up in Port Royal at the beginning were Dutch Jews who encouraged, were encouraged by the relationship between Cromwell and Rabbi ben Menashe, Menashe ben Israel. These settlers started to attract Jews from Bayonne and Bordeaux. So if you think your ancestry was only Spanish, you're right, because the Jews of Bayonne and Bordeaux were people who escaped from the Inquisition and settled in Bayonne and Bordeaux, who allowed them to settle in these two French border towns in particular. So who were these people that, who were these Jews that ended up in Port Royal? Were they just merchant or artisans working on the construction of forts or whatever else? is not really known as again as state that the earthquake destroyed many records. On the other hand, the purchase of the island of Manhattan and the sale of Suriname, which had plantations, brought some Jewish families to the west of Jamaica, where they settled to grow some sugar cane. <clears throat> we also have to recognize that the Jews who had entered England after 376 years of exile remember that, 376 years of exile, also left England to seek their fortunes in Jamaica. So we now have Spanish, former Spanish Jews. We have Jews from Martinique, from Bayonne and Bordeaux. We have Jews who had homes in England and turned up in Jamaica. And in the 1820s, we had a significant number of German Jews who ended up in Jamaica. There was one fellow named Sigmund Schibel, his son George built a house which I think most of you have had some thing to do with. It's called Devon House. And he, is, he was one of the German Jews that came here in the 1820s. There are others. I won't call all the other names because they're not Jews today, but that's part of our history. So most Jews became more interested in trade than in agriculture. In particular, they spoke Spanish and could trade with relatives in the Iberian countries and Central and South America. Why I remember the, why I'm stating the Iberian countries is because those who converted to Catholicism were still family, even though they were Catholic. And that's part of the fascination of this part of the world and the changes that took place over those three to 400 years. Port Royal boomed and as a commercial center, it became very, very significant with about 8,000 people, which all collapsed with the earthquake of, 16, of 7, 1692. The successes of these Jews in Port Royal caused envy, causing the English merchants to protest. Interestingly, as this community grew and had nowhere to bury their dead, they had to purchase land across the harbor, and they did so in Hunts Bay to create a cemetery. It's still there with the earliest marked tombs dated 1672. We think that earlier tombs marked were, were probably with wood, which has rotted over the many years since then. The bodies were brought over by rowboats, as had taken place in other sites, such as in Curacao, and of course in Holland. The congregation today maintains it, maintains this cemetery after its latest restoration. <clears throat> so, after the great earthquake of June 7, 1692, the Port Royal was followed, the Port Royal destruction was followed by a fire in 1703, causing most of the Jews to move and settle in the capital now known as Spanish Town. A synagogue was planned and built known as 
Kachal Kadosh, Neve Shalom, in the style of the recent London synagogue, Baby Smarks. And I hope Rabbi Shalom Morris is listening in the style of the recent synagogue, Baby Smarks. So, yes, there was a copying going on, but it was, and it was in the same period of time, so early 1700s. So, the site is still there. It's on Monk and Adelaide Street. Uh, <clears throat> And we have done significant amount of archaeological work on it. We know exactly where everything was and still is, but not all of it is there to be seen. So as the plantation economy grew, the Jewish migration to the coastal settlements, servicing the growing, the growing plantation economy had begun. By the early 18th century, one of the ports frequented by the ships owned by the merchant Prince of Newport, as I mentioned, Aaron, Aaron Lopez, frequented Lucy for agricultural goods, which included at the time, interestingly, indigo. As the economy grew, English and German Jews, which I mentioned, started arriving and eventually they built Mikvah Israel Synagogue in Spanish Town in 1796. So Spanish Town by then had two synagogues. The synagogue was used up until 1860 when that synagogue was destroyed or not used any longer and then all moved to the Nevi Shalom synagogue which was destroyed by the 1907 earthquake and not rebuilt. The reason was we had now moved to Kingston and settled Kingston. The Nevi Shalom synagogue site as I said has still exists and it would be lovely to even find a way to do things with it. One of the more exciting things was that when we first, shall I say, discovered it, which is an unfortunate word, um, we all gathered together to sing Kaddish for those in the neighboring cemetery. And that brought tears in that time to everybody's eyes. So we are significantly connected to our, peace, our past and to our ancestors. So, as the Jewish population grew, so did the need for cemeteries and Spanish town boasted of three until recently. The main Spanish and Portuguese cemetery had been abandoned and was eventually sold as have others in the, in the island of the initial 21 cemeteries and now only counting 14. Today, all have had their graves catalogued and recorded properly. That is an extraordinarily interesting achievement and I have to give thanks to all those who contributed as volunteers to that program over the over about 14 years it was quite an exercise in fact i one can even boast that we actually completed the cataloging of all jamaican jewish graves that we knew of before israel completed theirs last year kingston was founded after the earthquake of 1693 but the first synagogue shari hashemaim was built in 1744. the english and german synagogue in kingston Shangri Yosher was built in 1787. It was rebuilt in 1837, and later the both were destroyed in the fire, the Great Fire of Kingston of 1882. We all have the Great Fire of London of 1666, but there was a Great Fire of Kingston in 1882. Interestingly, the peak number of Jews at that time seemed to be in around in the late 1880s numbering over 2,500 persons. Shari Shalom was built then to replace the other synagogue on Duke Street after the 1882 fire and was rebuilt as we all know after the 1907 earthquake. There were other synagogues but only Shari Shalom survived. In 1921 all congregations mer merged to found the United Congregation of Israelites. Interestingly the Bendigamas, the blessing at the end of a meal, is still sung in Spanish after the meal at Pesach. And in some, in some homes, it can be sung after every meal, including in, in particular after the Friday night meal. It's a blessing at the end of a meal, and it is still sung in Spanish in Sephardic communities. It is interesting to note that Ladino was never used in Jamaica, whereas it is still used by Mediterranean Sephardi. This is probably due to the fact that descendants of conversos had not continued to use it in Spain and Portugal, and so it became for them a forgotten language due to the likelihood of them being caught if they used it by the Inquisition. So that's part of why we think it was no longer continued 
as a language for our safadi. With all these sites for worship, people lived in proximity to them both in Kingston, in, the, in proximity to them in both Kingston and Spanish Town, and walked to services. Obviously, there were no cars, but they could have gone by horse and buggy. And I'm not sure what the religious correctness is, but we believe that most of them were, the synagogues were built where they were easily accessible to the, where the Jews lived. And they also practiced relatively orthodox Judaism until nearly the end of the 19th century, employing, employing significant rabbis and maintain, maintaining kosher, kosher slaughtering. This is a, an interesting pattern that has come to light more recently. We have dealt with much of the physical aspects of Jews over these past 360 years, but not much on the people. So, Prior to 1831, Jews were treated in effect as second-class citizens, similar to that of free colored, those who were mainly free descendants of the enslaved. What is also interesting is that after 1831, and you remember we do have the Delgado tankard as was given to Delgado for his role in getting us freed to become full citizens of Jamaica. And after 1831, and the Jews who then qualified with land and income, who were able to vote and stood for election to the legislature, were themselves started to be elected to the legislature. What is interesting is eventually, as you all know, that Jews were able to have enough people in the legislature that the legislature closed for Yom Kippur. I think at that time there were 13 Jews in the legislature. But what is also interesting is that the majority support for the Jews of Jamaica standing for election were the free colored at that time, or in fact, after emancipation, free, all free Jamaicans who had the right to vote, voted overwhelming to put the Jews in positions in the legislature. That is a fascinating telling story of the relationships that existed for the period that we are talking about up to and when we had a uh, able to have a legislature for that type of election. After that, of course, after 1865, our legislature was disbanded and we became a colonial society. Um, that's another story, but we will not go under that one. So <clears throat> we have to recognize that as a relatively few unconnected males and females over the first 200 years of Jewish life in Jamaica, there was little immigration to the island. So many married members of their families, uncles marrying nieces, cousin marrying cousins, and so forth. And so one of the alternatives for the business of living was the alternatives that we, we consider as common law relationships. Men in particular, having families without marriage. In many cases, the women that I have seen in my research indicate that they married the men that they sought to have a relationship with, but not necessarily all the men. These relationships brought many persons into the society without returning to the practice of their ancestors, many joining the religion of the other parent. Today, there are hundreds of thousands of Jamaicans with Jewish ancestors. It's a fascinating story, and part of it was that with the orthodoxy of the 18th century and 19th century, conversions were not taken, undertaken. And there's a study that is now being done by a Jamaica, by a professor in, in on, on whose <coughs> whose knowledge of the Jamaican story is, is amazing, and we are hoping, looking forward to seeing that document which will deal with the business of conversions in the very near future. Okay, so what do we have? We have many Jamaicans today with Portuguese and other Jewish names who are descendants of Jews and are non-Jews, and are descendants of Jews and non-Jews. One of the interesting experiences of the late 20th century was the reality that the Archbishop of Kingston Anglican Archbishop of Kingston was a cousin 
of the then religious leader of the Jewish community at the time. And if you want to call the name, call me. <laughs> um, Jews succeeded in many professions, law, medicine, business in particular, shopkeeping and agriculture were also pursued, but gave way to the advent of Chinese immigration in the role of shopkeeping and the dominance of English plantocracy in the growing of sugar, bananas, coconuts in the 19th and 20th century. Jews entered into the construction industry in the 20th century. One of the landmarks was the design and the construction of the World Theater. Jews also played a role in Jamaica's culture with the support of theater, art, and music. And here I want to mention Stanley Motor, who pioneered the recording of music, in particular Mento, which gave the start, in my opinion, to so much more musical creativity that the island's people are now famous for. And do I need to answer the name of reggae? No. So we understand that he, I, I hold him as a major player in our cultural Absolutely. expression. And in the field of education, apart from an early effort in the mid 19th century, the Jewish congregation under the initiative of Rabbi Hooker created the Hillel Academy, one of the best private schools in the island today. We were also possibly the largest private contrib contributor to the University of the West Indies of building the reading rooms after Hurricane Gilbert. And there is much more. Shopkeepers in the seaport towns that created families such as Delgado in Falmouth, Mendes and Hart in Montego Bay, Levy from St. Catherine, Marshallek and Mordecai in Morant Bay, Abendana in Portland, Lopez in Clarendon, Delissa in St. James, Vaz in Old Harbor, Bravo in St. Anne and St. Catherine, and dozens in Kingston, including my own families. Then there are the doctors and lawyers. There were businessmen and many others in a variety of positions, including those who worked in the civil service. One exceptional family was the Ashenheim, the Cordova family. The Cordovas being descendants of the famous rabbi who created and ran the Gleaner from 1834 to the present. More recently, that is since independence in 1962, we have had senators and ministers of government ambassadors and many sitting on boards as members of and as chairman and to, to get my halfpenny halfpenny worth of recognition I served in those positions in some of those positions for over 44 years. One cannot close speaking to the Jewish history of Jamaica without congratulating the Jewish people, the Jamaican people for having lived with Jews in their midst peacefully, being part of families of non-Jews, each member worshiping without any real exhibition of anti-Semitism, racism, or any other isms that plays, plague so many societies. This is unique in today's world, where each believer is as welcome in each other's place of worship as if they were members of that congregation. As a major genealogist tracing people's roots, the respect that people have for a Jewish ancestor is remarkable. Long may all these attributes rule in this island's nation's people who welcomed La Nacion over 360 years into the emerging population, a population whose majority have climbed from enslavement to independence largely by its own efforts. May I also comment on the role I play as the Honorary Consul for Israel in Jamaica. The relationships between the two countries and peoples are such that I have little or better stated few issues to deal with. I would like to see more technical expertise from Israel come our way, but both countries have their own economic circumstances to deal with. May I thank all who have listened to this presentation. May each Caribbean community do the same for themselves. Special thank you to the Chabad movement for the close relationships that we enjoy today in Jamaica and Cayman each practicing Judaism according to their own beliefs and respecting the rights of other Jews accordingly. Thank you both. Thank you both for hosting this program. So please, let me leave you with a last question. As a descendant of Jewish families who have lived in Jamaica for over 250 years, am I a Jewish Jamaican or am I a Jamaican Jew? What do you think? Shalom. Wow, thank you so much, Mr. Ainsley. That was incredible. And 
you know, they say in Hebrew, Megala Tefach Mechaset Vachayim, reveal just a bit, but there, we know there's so much more that remains to be shared. So it's our hope and prayer that you'll be with us, God willing, for many years. Uh, we have a stream till 120, and you'll be able to share with us your presentations and knowledge and information for the benefit of um, Jews and the all Kiman and Caribbean residents. Uh, some questions that are coming in on the chat. Um, if you want to have a look at those. But um, Ainsley, I have a question for you, please, if that's okay. You know, please, please, please. I'm here for all the questions. They say, you know, why is a windshield larger than a rear view mirror? Because we always want to be able, you know, to look forward. It's important as to look back. We always want to focus on what's ahead of us. How do you see the future of the Caribbean Jewish community? How are you seeing signs of, of promising renewal and revival over the last couple of years? Where do you see us heading? No, that's a very interesting question. Um, we are technically and perhaps practicing Judaism from a traditional background of Spanish and Portuguese coming from the old Sephardic congregations that existed for 700 years in Spain. So it's not easy for us to change our rituals and our practices to that of the modern different practices that are exposed, we are exposed to, and in particular with, in a sense, through the Chabad movement. But we have to recognize, as I spoke earlier, that we are all Jews and we have to respect each other's right to be able to practice Judaism as we wish. So I argue today that I respect the Chabad movement. I look forward to more relationships with the Chabad movement, with the dis disciplines of the Chabad movement, I, re I respect the way that the Chabad movement is opening the doors for Judaism in the Caribbean, not because it's a question only of religion, but the ability to have kosher meat, kosher food, the ability for people who wish to pray daily, the ability for the sensitivity of the Chabad rabbinical movement, and at the same time recognizing that in our own sense, we have a diminishing community due to assimilation and to a certain extent, migration. Don't ask me to give you the story on migration because we started to migrate from the days of, 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 of cholera. Uh, we died, my, similarly with the other pandemics that took place. Um, and, and, and the good news today is that I think most of the people who are suffering in the pandemic countries are willing to come to live in Jamaica because we've been able to look as if we can control it. So that's another yes. issue. That's another issue. So yes, I look forward, and I've been long-winded in this. I look forward to the continuing relationship of strong Jewish behavior practices in, in, in our countries and, and, and reach out to those who are perhaps not comfortable with it, as I mentioned earlier, to look more seriously at it, recognizing that you are not necessarily changing the way that they wish to practice Judaism, but also broadening their exposure to what Judaism is really all about. Tikkun olam. For sharing that, that's really, that's really beautiful. Um, we have some, some questions that are coming in um, and, and some comments in the group chat, uh, if you wanna have a look at that. Um, you know, if, any, if anyone would, um, I noticed a few, a few uh, raise their hands. Um, I would like to unmute now. Uh, I, I think it's Miss Sandra. Um, I just have it here in order how it comes up, but um, if you have a question for Mr. Ainsley or something, you're, you're unmuted. Yes, Miss Sandra. Yes, Miss Sandra. Uh, All right, one more question. And Please, I'm, 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 I'm here for the rest of the evening. You, you, okay. can't, you can't question me to shut me up. That's the one thing I can tell you. <laughs> Benny Goldstein has a question. Is okay. Let's find him. Goldstein. If you can raise your hand again. We can unmute you quickly. Okay, there, there, are, there are a couple of things. Which I, I see one 
Is there a United Congress or a reunion in Kingston in the future? Um, that's an interesting question. We have had a major, 10 years ago, a major conference on the history of the Jews of the Caribbean um, that we will have. Sorry, Ainsley, you got muted. If you could unmute yourself. Okay, I, I was talking to the idea of a United Israelite Congregation reunion in Jamaica. And that, that's a possibility in the future, but it's not an easy thing to recognize. Um, and of course, we have to get rid of COVID first. So that's another story. Gibraltar camp, I see that somebody wants to know about the Camp Gibraltar. The Camp Gibraltar was created by the British to house the citizens of the island of Gibraltar when they were turning it into a, a commissioned ship, an island, but being commissioned as a ship. And so they wanted to move the civilians out of Gibraltar and they built this camp, which is now the camp, campus of the University of the West Indies. Um, the people who, the Jews who were at in Lisbon, and I knew the story well, were being about to be sent back to Germany. Their visas had expired and they sent a cable to Churchill and he invited Eden to find a place for them to be moved to. And he, they found that there was unused facilities in the Gibraltar camp. And so 260 out of them were brought to Jamaica in the first round. Eventually over 600 Jews were saved from the Holocaust in the Gibraltar camps. None have stayed in Jamaica. They all migrated, and the only thing I can claim is that I was actually able to live with one of those families in England when I was at university, a Polish family. Okay, next question. Someone wants to know who was the first Jew who came to Jamaica and settled in Jamaica? Well, the answer to that is I told you earlier, and I did actually write an answer to this particular question. Um, if you pick up your, your email, you'll find it. There were, we don't know. We don't know. And I'm not claiming that Columbus was either, so that's another story. Okay. I, I know I sent that an email. I'm just going to read uh, so everybody can hear the answers to those questions. Were the Jews involved in the sugar plantation? No, no, no. Jews were not really involved in sugar. First Jews that were involved in sugar was the first Jews that built the Yarmouth factory. Before that, Jews may have grown some sugar cane, but the, the whole of the sugar industry was primarily owned and run by the plantocracy. We have here, uh, besides Spanish Town and Kingston, uh, where else, on the, uh, and Montego Bay, where else on the uh, and Falmouth? Is there any other places there was a formal Jewish community? No, there was the, apart from Montego Bay, and 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 you are succeeding a family in particular that uh, settled originally in Montego Bay in the mid seventeen early seventeen hundreds, and they produced a fam a, ma a rabbi by the name of uh, Henry Pereira Mendes, who became the most famous rabbi at Sheriff's Israel in New York. So we do have a significant. You got muted. We lost you. Oh, no, I've unmuted again. I've just yeah, learned how to uh, unmute. We actually have his uh, great-grandson or great-great-grandson uh, uh, with us tonight. Hi, Joshua Mendes from New York. Yes, 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 yes. We're, I'm, really, I'm, the, like, I'm descended from them, too. So that's where we're, we're, we're part of that story. I mean, again, we talked about hundreds of thousands of Jamaicans who have Jewish ancestry. Let's face it, after 300 years, uh, you have a situation where the multiplication of the size of families is enormous, humongous. And certainly um, the spread goes very, very wide. And so, yes, it, it's, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. It's in fact an interesting problem. Um, the question, one of the questions was, was there a mikveh in Jamaica? You know, in no, no, the answer, the answer to that is we haven't found one yet. But the Spanish town synagogue was beside, the, literally beside the, the Rio Cobre. So we suspect that there might have been a bathhouse there for the purposes of, 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 of a mikvah. Um, 
and can I say that the same thing existed possibly in downtown Kingston because there are a number of streams that ran through the city which of course no longer uh, exist because they've all been covered up by, by construction. And the last question he writes over here, what is the relationship between Jamaica and Israel? Well, I mentioned that earlier. Jamaica, Jamaica, Israel has always recognized Jamaica and vice versa. Even in the days of what was known as the Group of 77 uh, in the 70s, Jamaica was never, never, I, I didn't isolate itself from relationships with Israel and vice versa. So that's, that's part of the interesting aspect of Jamaica. And today, today, I, I, as, as a consul for Israel, I, I am free to visit Anybody and anywhere. And I, a couple of a couple of months ago, there was a young Israeli gentleman that was stranded off the coast of Jamaica. And I was reading about your efforts, Mr. Ainsley, together with Rabbi Raskin and other, I'm sure, many others. The Israeli ambassador in the Dominican Republic worked tirelessly, didn't sleep, you know, night after night, working tirelessly to get the gentleman uh, on island and back back home to Israel. And I, I think it's so important that we recognize, you know, the role that. We're all, we're all in this together. And if we can help out each other, uh, we must do so. And you've exemplified that through your many decades of service. So thank you for teaching us, the, young, the younger generation, how to carry the, the torch forward. Well, I look forward to being able to visit Israel because his mother has promised me a meal that I will never forget. Bezrat Hashem. <laughs> May that be very soon with, with, the coming, with the coming of Mashiach very soon, speedily in our days. Just one final question, Mr. Mr. Enriquez. Please, please. What, what was it like for a young man to have a bar mitzvah growing up in Jamaica? What was, what was, uh, what was involved with that? Well, of course, at my age, I was part of a much larger congregation. The synagogue for many major functions and holidays was full top to bottom. Seats had to be ordered and numbers were on seats. And you couldn't sit in a numbered seat if you were not a member of that number or didn't have a hold on that particular number. So that was part of the story. Upstairs mostly were women, but I had a grandmother and a grand aunt who would not climb the stairs, so they got numbers of the seat downstairs. So yes, there was a, a, there was, there was a certain le a laxity, or shall we say, an understanding of, of what upstairs sitting for women was all about and how would others could sit downstairs. Um, we had a religious school that met every Sunday. We had a lot of different programs in the religious school. Uh, and, and of course, we all had practiced the services long before we were ready to be bar mitzvah. So yes, but we did not have bat mitzvahs. And in those days, women were not part of the congregation that were called uh, for an aliyah for the reading of Torah. But so as a result of that, again, the major, of course, story was today I'm a fountain pen boy. Because in Bar Mitzvah presents were largely fountain pens and books. <laughs> so that was, the, that was a going, the going aspect of, of the Bar Mitzvah. And yes, there were functions after the Bar Mitzvah. We did not have a, a hall in which we could have functions. Today we have a, a, a museum and a, and, a hope and, a, and a hall where we can not only have functions, but um, we can have all kinds of other functions in, in the hall, including, including sailor, sailor dinners. In uh, those days, we didn't. The, 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 the synagogue um, center was, was apart from the synagogue and two streets away. So, but it worked. And it was, it was where we bonded as youngsters with others. And I see, I think there are a couple of people here that I know that were in that, in that age group that I have seen on, 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 on the on on screen. Facebook. Was that? Well, we, we, uh, we got our- Did we uh, learn, did we learn, wait, let, me, let me finish. We learned, sure. we learned Hebrew, to, at least to read Hebrew. We learned Hebrew alphabet. We never learned to speak it. But that was not our fault. That was, a, that was a, what was taught to us and was perhaps the value system of our parents. I regret that. Sorry, go ahead. We have a question here. How many people, uh, how many Jewish people are living today in Kingston? 
the total Jewish population, with the exception of the people that are part of your North Coast experience, are probably mass or minus a hundred. I would say to get together with uh, all the um, how do you call it, vacation homeowners on this side, yeah, you could add another hundred for sure. You know, those who come during the winter. Oh, certainly. The sunbirds are, snowbirds are, are, are certainly an important aspect of what you are doing, and I, we appreciate it. And we, I, I personally am very happy for what's happening there and in Cayman. And, and, and hopefully, you know, we'll find that also in Barbados and in some of the other islands. Thank you. Um, you thank you your... so Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Robert Raskin. No problem. And, okay, we have another question over here. Let me find it. About the slave owners, we answered that there wasn't. Here it is. What about Isaac Mendes, the artist? Can you talk about him a bit? Isaac Mendes Belisario. Yes. The grandson of Alexander Lindo. The Alexander Lindo family was prominent in Jamaica. And I didn't mention others, such as the Costa family, because Lindos and the Costas as a as family are extended right across the island. Uh, can I tell you that they were all from one source? No. They were the Costa and Lindo are very common names in Sp in Spanish and Portuguese world, but uh, Isaac Mendes Belisario was actually um, a recognized artist of the day, painting for the first time as a Jamaican Jamaican images. So from that point of view, he is extraordinarily important. Prior to that, most of the images painted in Jamaica, these landscapes and images, were painted by English artists who were brought to Jamaica by the plantation owners to record their holdings and their, and their wealth. Okay. I want to say thank you very much to Mr. Enriquez, and thank you everybody for participating. I'm going to give a, uh, as well, Rabbi Pesner, to say goodbye to those in Cayman and from those around the world. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ainsley Enriquez, my dear friend and mentor, for uh, enlightening us with this beautiful uh, journey. And uh, we're, I'm honored to live on, the, on this rich land of so much history. I think that's why the land of Jamaica is so fertile. It has, uh, you know, it has so much uh, beautiful history over here. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody in person. Come visit to Jamaica. You can see our website, jewishjamaica.com, for all your Jewish needs. And about the mikvah question, right now it, it looks like there was never a mikvah, but we hope very, very soon that we already have the land and we already dug the hole. And very soon there will be a mikvah here in Jamaica. With God's help, it could be in the next coming months with uh, Hashem's help. Chavod, Rabbi Pesner. Thank you so much. Once again, it's been a real honor and privilege. It's uh, wonderful seeing so many friends, new and old, on this, um, on, this, uh, on this broadcast, on the Zoom meeting. I want to wish you all well. It's a uh, challenging time that we're all facing. And I just want to wish everyone that you should have been blessed with good health, peace of mind, and ease of spirit as we prepare in the coming weeks for the high holidays. May Hashem bless us all with a happy and healthy, sweet new year. And be may all uh, illness be removed from all people and especially all of our acquaintances. And we should be able to gather speedily in our days together as one people, one love, one nation in Jerusalem, our capital, our eternal capital. And until then, we'll see each other at Simchas, whether in Jamaica, Cayman, United States, wherever we may find ourselves. Um, and of course, if you'd like to um, get in touch, any future questions, Cayman.com our Facebook page, where we're going to be sharing this broadcast, both on the Jewish Cayman page, as well as on the Chabad Jamaica page. Uh, so you can share that with any friends and family. Unfortunately, Zoom, um, uh, we, we max out of our account tonight. So we're sharing that also on Facebook Live. And um, wish you well. And uh, may Hashem bless you all. And we should meet for happy occasions. Shalom. Well, now, Shalom. We'll unmute everyone, and you can wish each other well. And um, we should have only good news.
You're all on mute. May, may, may I, Rabbi, may I, may I challenge you to sure. have these programs run through the various islands of the Caribbean so we get to know and meet each other and understand each other better. Shalom. Absolutely. Shalom to all. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For preserving history. Thank you, Rabbi. What? Did you know? Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.